For those of you who um, don't know me, I know a lot of you, but for those who don't, um, Francis Forgioni and I used to work here part-time, and uh, my husband Bill is down here, and since he retired January 1st, uh, this is actually still our primary residence, and we didn't, we didn't like move, move, but we will go uh, back and forth to Massachusetts a lot uh, since Bill retired, and has, that's where he's from, and has family out there, so. But it is really good to be here. Uh, some of you asked what happened to my arm. Uh, I fell, the moral of the story is, don't like wear a mask and your sunglasses inside a building where you can't see like the last step. And uh, so I took a tumble last weekend. <laughs> so anyway, um, I'm really glad to be here with you guys today. And so um, today we are gonna read the story about the woman caught in adultery out of John 8. So let's read that. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery, and they put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. And then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. So, uh, a lot of you know that I'm a counselor, and I, I love kind of blending spirituality and psychology. It's kind of my thing. Um, but I look at this story, and I'm sure you've heard it before, or maybe you have, but um, I want to share, you know, just a, a perspective on this story that I think is really significant. And as I look at this story, I see these three roles that are in the story. There are the stoners, the stoners. It goes over well. I'm going to call them the persecutors, okay? These were the Pharisees who brought the woman who was caught in adultery, okay? The woman caught in adultery, we're going to call her the victim because she truly was about to lose her life and was pretty powerless to do much about it. And then there was Jesus and we'll call him the rescuer, okay? So we have these three roles, primary, the primary characters, that are going on in this story. And the Pharisees were the ones throwing the stone. And it makes me think about, uh, who do you feel like is throwing stones at you these days? Maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's somebody at work. Maybe it's because you're not wearing a mask or because you are or because you got vaccinated or you didn't. Um, the stone throwers, who, who, are, who is throwing stones at you and who are you throwing stones at? Who are you wanting to throw stones? Peter's pointing back to the guys behind him. Uh, and, then, and then the woman who's the victim, like where are you feeling hopeless and powerless and uh, just at someone else's mercy and you can't do anything about it. And, you know, I think about this woman and while she was truly powerless in that moment, I mean, she did commit adultery, right? So she wasn't completely blameless. And then the rescuer, like, is there somebody in your life right now that you're trying to rescue? Maybe it's a wayward child or a wayward spouse or... Uh, somebody in your circle that you care about with an addiction or a problem that you're, you're trying to help and you don't know what to do about it. So these are the three roles. Sometimes the persecutor might be called the villain, and 
If you think about all the great movies, all the great children's stories from Cinderella to Little Red Riding Hood to Superman and Spider-Man, and you see these, these three roles. There's the victim, persecutor, there's the villain, and there's the hero or the rescuer. So we see it everywhere. And if you were to just read through all the stories of the Bible, you would see these three roles. Uh, David and Goliath, uh, Daniel in the lion's den, uh, the Good Samaritan. So there's all kinds of stories. You could constantly find these three roles. Well, in 1968, a guy named Stephen Cartman, who was an American psychiatrist, he named this triangle that goes on between these three people. And it, you can look on the internet, there's thousands and thousands of things you can read on Cartman's drama triangle. And there's a drama that gets played out with these three roles that uh, kind of stuck in psychology and it shows up in a lot of families where there's addiction and, and all kinds of things. And this triangle, while Stephen Cartman kind of put names on it, it really, <laughs> he got credit for it, but it really started way back in the Garden of Eden. It was going on back in the Garden of Eden. And the serpent had planted seeds of mistrust and fear and got this whole triangle going. And the serpent actually came along and kind of portrayed God as the bad guy, the one who's holding back from Adam and Eve and, and holding back something good from them. And he actually like kind of set them up, Adam and Eve, to fall into this role where then he was trying to be the rescuer and go and see, I'm, I'm like telling you what you should do and God's holding back. You know, God had set firm boundaries about the garden and the tree in the middle of the garden. He said, don't eat, they did. They, God comes looking for Adam and Eve and they're hiding. God asks Adam, did you eat of the tree? He gets defensive and he blames Eve. God asks Eve, did you eat? She gets defensive and she persecutes the serpent and the triangle is already in motion. Well, God sets straight who the real enemy is and promises to rescue Adam and Eve by crushing the serp serpent's head. Not right in that moment, but later on down the road. But they still had to leave, leave the garden and God allowed the natural consequences to play out. And these three roles that have been around from the beginning keep playing out uh, with all of us. And we all participate in this. And I have a feeling you will identify with this. So let me describe a little further. The persecutor, the villain, the prosecutor is is someone who has a blaming, accusing, critical, judgmental tone, uh, maybe even punishing. Um, they can be very intimidating. They can be very authoritarian, rigid, controlling, bullying, talk down to other people, intimidate, name calling. They don't really value other people's opinions or views. And their message is kind of, I'm right, and it's your fault your fault, okay? The next is the victim. And by the way, there are two kind of one-up roles, and there's one role that's kind of in a one-down position. So we're gonna put him down here, him, her, whoever it is, okay? <laughs> These two are in a kind of a one-up. I'm looking down at you, and this one's the helper, you know, so this one is kind of, you know, you, you poor thing, you know, you can't do anything. So we'll put, put that one down there. So let me say this before I talk about the victims. There truly are victims who are powerless in, in situations where it be a victim of crime or rape or sexual abuse or a natural disaster or uh, a major health crisis or a car accident or something. There truly are victims who are helpless and powerless. So I'm not talking about those as I play some of this out today. I'm talking about people who present themselves as helpless when they really may not be completely helpless, okay? So the, so the victim, um, they may be passive, they may be unable to solve or make decisions, solve some of their problems. They're, uh, 
again, present themselves as powerless. They feel like life happens to them. They can be quite sensitive. Sometimes they're passive aggressive or even manipulative. They complain of unfair treatment, cruelty, oppression, sometimes collapse into silence or tears. And this role often can feel young, almost like a, a younger version of the adult, maybe five or 10 or 15 years old, it can feel young. And the message is, I'm blameless and poor me. Okay, that's the victim. I like this Calvin and Hobbes cartoon that I found where he says, nothing I do is my fault. It's too little in my notes to read, so I'll have to go over here. Uh, my family is dysfunctional, my parents won't empower me, and consequently, my, I'm not self-actualized. My behavior is addictive, functioning in a disease process of toxic codependency. I need holistic healing and wellness before I'll accept any responsibility for my actions. One of us needs to stick his head in a bucket of water. I love the culture of victimhood. <laughs> okay? And then finally, we have the rescuer. They might also be called mediators. They might also be called enablers. And it's kind of classic codependency, which is a compulsion to help or fix or rescue other people. And the key word is on compulsion. Like, I can't not. I, I feel guilty if I don't help. And sometimes the helping, a lot of times the helping is more about, I need to feel good about myself as a hel helper, so I will come and help you, and it meets my need to feel valued and important to you. They like to fix problems, and they like to ignore their own. Sometimes they can be seen as engulfing or meddling, and they give the victim permission to fail, too much tolerance. Uh, they actually keep the victim dependent on them and keep them in that role by helping them so much. And their message is, I'm good. Let me help you. I'll do it for you. Let me take care of it. And I love this little cartoon that says, I've got your back. <laughs> that pretty much describes, <laughs> okay, the rescuer. I've got your back. Um, so we have this triangle here. The persecutors resent the rescuer for coming in to help them. Yet, they create situations where somebody needs rescuing by being blaming and accusing and attacking and all that. Victims often give the persecutor something to blame by their behavior, something they're not doing, something they often give them something to blame. Vic victims sometimes may even subconsciously seek out a persecutor and a rescuer to stay in that role. Rescuers uh, keep victims dependent on them, and sometimes they look for people to help so that they can stay in that role themselves. So let me bring in a couple of examples in day-to-day -day life that maybe you can relate to, and. Uh, I think probably you can, but we see this playing out in a lot of different ways. So, so let's say here's, here's a mom, here's teenage son, here's dad, okay? Teenage son, what were you doing last night? I thought I told you nobody was supposed to spend the night. What are you thinking? Tell me what happened. Who did you have over here? I don't know these kids. Who are they? I can't believe you did that. Don't lie to me. You've lied to me before, you little liar. I can't believe that. And what do you mean? What? You what? No, no. I actually woke up in the middle of the night and I saw six people lying around. Don't tell me you had one friend over here, you liar. Okay. Might sound like that. Mom, what was I supposed to do? I had a friend over and, you know, we, we were watching a movie and we fell asleep and that friend brought their friends and I didn't know and, and I, you know, I, I couldn't help it, you know, like, what am I supposed to do? Dad, mom's being ridiculous. She has grounded me for three months and you won't believe it. She is just so harsh on me. And I, I have a major event coming up and there's no way I can miss that.
Son, don't worry. I know, mom gets on me too like that and it drives me crazy. I'll talk to mom, don't worry, and we'll figure out a way for you to go to that event. And, oh, you need some money? Sure, here's a hundred bucks. And uh, <laughs> no, no problem. Okay, there's the triangle, all right? <laughs> it could be something like this. There's one example, here's another example. Here's a uh, mom, again, well, I guess that's mom again. It could be dad, it could be dad. We'll, we'll make it dad, all right? Here's mom, all right? Dad's going, all you do is work. Work, 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 and I can't even, I, I can't even get any time with you, and you don't pay attention to me, and I am sick and tired of just how much focus you put in this, and it's not even paying off. You, you don't even get paid that much. Like, oh my gosh, and you're not getting stuff done around the house, and you know, even the kids are like, where's mom? Like, what, what is your deal? Honey, you know this is our busy season. I'm like, what am I supposed to do? I got, I've got so much on my plate, I, no one appreciates me. Here's a coworker, we'll say male coworker. You are so hardworking, I have never seen you with a, with a work ethic like that. You're amazing. Man, if I could find more employees like that. By the way, hey, we're going out for drinks after work, you wanna come? Oh, I don't know who else is coming. It might just be you and me, but, you know, we'll just see. Does that sound familiar? So, there could be a lot of scenarios that play out. It could be coworker to coworker. Oh, I'm going to go talk to HR, because I didn't like what you said. It could be, um, well, this is what happens in the courts. The attorney, the person being accused of a crime, the jury the other attorney. It's happening in politics right now, right and left. It grieves me to see what's happening in our culture. The left accuses the right, the right accuses the left. They go back and forth, blaming and persecuting between the victim and the persecutor. And you know who the rescuers are? Some expert scientist, some ex-Republican or ex-Democrat that we got on our side, and we get them to say what we were saying and see, and it's happening there, it's happening, and it's what happens in war. We're persecuting you, we're persecuting back and forth. Anybody relate? Anybody not relate? <laughs> uh, so Bill and I, we get in this on a regular basis. He's smiling at me. <laughs> in the small scale, we get in this a lot. You know, it happens maybe even every day. <laughs> uh, so I'll persecute him, he'll persecute me. And you know who the rescuer is? It's when Bill says, I'm gonna call your mom and tell her what you're doing. That is what he says to me. And you know what I say to him? What would Brett do? Well, Brett is his daughter who has very good manners and treats people really well. And so I go, well, what would Brett do? What would she say about what you're doing right now? So even though they're not in the room, we, we bring them in, okay? So anyway, um, we managed to repair pretty well, but, but let me tell you, the repair is actually really important. Okay, so I think these three roles are the enemies counterfeit and twist on the Trinity. I think early on in the Garden of Eden, he twisted the whole thing and it's been a ripple effect through our entire generations. The sins of the Father is passed on to the children. And that's not a, that's not a maybe, that is a description of what's happening. So the, the triangle is a twist, it's messed up. The energy of the triangle is about blame, fear, accusation, accusation, shame. The energy of this thing can spin like a top, going around and around and around. Um, we all know that we call the enemy the accuser, right? So this is, this is the energy of the accuser. And yet God gave, gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and of love and of discipline. So in contrast, let's look at the Trinity. A little simple diagram I have. 
Um, but the Trinity, we have the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. The Father is like we often talk about the Father's will. I love that song that Melanie did, Thy Will Be Done. The Father's will, but that the Father is a, like a protector. And the Father sees kind of the bigger picture. And God in his sovereignty sees the bigger picture. So when he says, do this or don't do this, it's not because he's a control freak. And it's not because he's persecuting. It's because he's wanting to protect us. He's uh, all-knowing, all-seeing, all-knowing, all-present, um, all-powerful. And yet he allows us to make a choice. He allows us to have consequences played out. And on a human level, when we're connecting to that presence, we're able to speak truth. This is a truth speaker, speaking the truth in love, setting boundaries, allowing those boundaries to be played out, sometimes calling a spade a spade, but doing it in love, wisdom, and still respecting that you have a choice. So Jesus came down in human form, which was a lowered position from where they were in the beginning. He, he humbled himself to become a human. Jesus was not a victim, but he was vulnerable. Vulnerable to suffer. His life wasn't taken, his life was given. He was connected to the support of the Father and the Spirit, but he still had to go through all this on his own, and he accepted that role. And on a human level, instead of being a victim, we can be vulnerable and give our life rather than allowing it to be taken, allowing and accepting some of the things that have happened to us in our life, and taking responsibility at times um, where, it's, where it's appropriate. And then the helper. You know, literally, the Spirit is called the helper, right? And the helper is the one to comfort us, to speak to us, and the fruit of the Spirit that's love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness. And uh, the Spirit believes you can do it. There's so many times I've prayed to get out of a situation and God didn't, like, get me out of it. <laughs> I still had to go through it. But the Spirit was there whispering in my ear about the love and the, the unconditional love and, like, believed that I could go with it and was there with me in it. So, in Isaiah 30, 21, it says, Wherever you turn to the right or the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you your ears were hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Like an intimate connection of this kind of communication is what we're, we're hoping for. So I'm going to read this story about the woman in the adultery one more time, okay? And I want to... Um, let me pull this back here. Read this one section, verses 4 to 11. So the Pharisees came, the Pharisees came, and they said to Jesus, hey, this woman down here, she was caught in the act of adultery. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. That Jesus stoops down and wrote in the dust with his finger. And they kept demanding an answer from Jesus. So he stood up again and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. And then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Where are your accusers? 
Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He believed in her. He said, go and sin no more. I think you can do it. He believed in her. He didn't track her down and chase her and check on her and, you know, all that. But he just believed in her and raised her up from a level that she had been previously. And the Pharisees were taken a notch down. Matthew 23 says, Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. I think Jesus, in this interaction, this exchange, he brilliantly not only saves the woman, but he actually is saving the Pharisee over here too by showing them they had a need. And I think he was also saving the crowd because in the crowd are people who can identify with her, and in the crowd there are people who can identify with the Pharisees. And he was speaking to them all at once. So now imagine all of this living inside here. Okay? We can play these roles out here, but imagine all of this now living inside your head because that is what happens. Romans 2.15 says this, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse and even excuse them. Excuse them. Their conflicting thoughts either accuse, I'll move this back up here, either accuse or excuse. So we have this constant exchange in our heads of this inside. Sometimes this is called the inner critic. It's that voice of the enemy that says, that blames and accuses, oh man, I can't believe I did that. I'm so stupid. What, what was I thinking? I should have done better. I can't believe that I'm not good enough. I'm worthless. And this one, oh, poor me. Everybody's against me. I can't do anything. I wish somebody would give me some sympathy. And I look for a rescuer. Sometimes the rescuer is alcohol, pornography, shopping, food, drugs, whatever, bag of donuts, my favorite frozen chocolate chips in the freezer. <laughs> Sometimes the persecutor is just a situation, but this lives in here. And this is the drama dance of the enemy that plays out inside. And I love this quote I found by Toby Mack that says this, sometimes you have to tell that negative committee that meets inside your head to just sit down and shut up. <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, sit down and shut up. Um, but in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, it says, but whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. We are designed to have communion with God. And that means communion with the Father, communion with the Son, and communion with the Spirit. When we can commune with the Father, we can learn how to speak our truth in love, set, set boundaries maybe, consequences that play out, see the bigger picture. When we're connected to the Son, we get clarity about where to sacrifice, where to give our life, where to take responsibility. And when we're connected to the Spirit, we listen to that inner quiet voice. And we are comforted. We have both layers inside of us, okay? And we can tune in to that channel of the drama triangle or we can tune into this and create an intimate relationship with God. Last week, Peter said in his sermon, in one of his points that he had about taking a walk with God, he said, the one you walk with changes the way you walk. I think a significant way that changes the walk is from this to this. 
all the way down. Changes the way you walk. Changes the spirit. The spirit of this is love and joy and justice and grace and forgiveness. That's the spirit of it. And so my encouragement today is like, we talked about this in my Enneagram class last week. What are the ways that you spend time with God? What are ways that you develop intimacy? Well, that can be through reading the word, listening to sermons, singing a song, going for a walk in nature, through children, through the seasons of the year, through movies. There can be all kinds of ways because his spirit is everywhere waiting to commune with you. And as you commune with, with him, he will show you where to speak, where to be firm, where to be vulnerable, where to take responsibility, where to come and show support, and where not to. At the cross, Philippians 2, 8, it says, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus willingly put himself in a one-down position in submission to the Father. He was vulnerable on the cross. He's the only scapegoat that was truly blameless. And even though the crowds jeered and the Romans persecuted, soldiers taunted him to save himself and come down off that cross, his life wasn't taken, it was given. And on the third day, the Father finally makes good on that promise way back in the Garden of Eden. It says, I will crush his head. I will crush the serpent's head, which was defeating death itself. So when Jesus rose from the dead, he was defeating the drama dance and giving us a new life that lives inside of us. In Psalm 110, I found this verse, I love, love this, because it says, uh, the Lord says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The enemy in the drama triangle, we want this section to just be your footstool. Down there, like, it's just my footstool. It's not controlling me. It's around, and sometimes it shows up. <laughs> I've got my foot on it. <laughs> I'm able to let it be my footstool. It's not the thing that's running me. It's the one I'm, I'm aware of it. Like, I see you, okay? I see you. There's a time to speak, and there's a time to be quiet. There's a time to let natural consequences play out. There's a time to be vulnerable, a time to take responsibility, a time to support, a time to hold back. And I think at communion, at communion, Jesus says, hey, little persecutor, come on up. You're actually not so blameless, you know. I see all the things in your heart, and I know what's going on, but come on, because I have a transformation for you. And he says to the victim, hey, little victim, come on up. I have a power for you that you will not believe. And I, uh, I will show you the power of vulnerability. And he says to the rescuer, hey, little rescuer, I'm the savior, not you. <laughs> Um, come on up, take a rest, man. Take some load off of your back. I've got this. So as you come to the table today, bring your persecutor, your victim, your rescuer, and allow it to be transformed. Continue to raise your awareness to the transformation that really is already there. It's already inside of you, just waiting to be communed with. So the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it saying, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat of it. And then he took the cup, and he poured, poured it, saying, drink all of it. This is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, like the triangle, the drama triangle. So come to the table today and receive his life from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I know this was kind of a taste of something that is really a very big topic. Um, and I know that, you know, when all the, that little committee that meets inside your head, a lot, of, a lot of ways it got there was from a lot of life experiences where this kept playing out over and over, and as a young kid all the way up, and 
and uh, it was in our hearts to begin with, but um, so is the life of Christ. And sometimes as a counselor, a lot of what I'm doing is going back to these old events and being present more with the spirit of compassion and understanding and nurture and truth and empowering and all kinds of things where we go and revisit past events and now with a different spirit behind it so that it can be transformed. And the prayer team is going to be down here. It's this little river. This is our river. <laughs> a river of life. Ted and Susan will be down here. If anybody would like prayer and you'd like to meet with a couple of folks and maybe this stirred up some things for you, you'd like to pray with someone, um, or maybe later it would prompt you to talk some more to a friend or more deeper, uh, deeper conversations. Uh, but in the end, my hope and prayer is that would lead us into a, a deeper, deeper understanding of his love, just like that song talked about. And that as we connect with that, we come up with a different spirit ourselves. So go in peace. Really great to be with you guys this morning. Amen.